that, we have a, a few minutes for discussion. So um, what I suggest is that we take the questions and then I'll ask my colleagues to answer the, the questions they'd like to address. So I, let's start with uh, Masoud. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. First of all, let me just say the terrific panel. And I really want to thank all of you for your interventions. Uh, I hope we can make the slides available that were used by Professor Flano as well. Uh, I have one question for you, and it picks up from your last comment, Michelle, which is how well do you think we are prepared for the next pandemic if it were to strike us in the next 12 months? One thing about COVID is that we developed a vaccine that works within a year, faster than at any time in history. No guarantee that we will be able to do it for the next pandemic. And the mortality rate was quite low, you know, less than 5%. And that, again, no guarantee that the next pandemic will have a low mortality rate. So you just identified, uh, Christian, what is needed. And the question I have for all of you is, how, how much progress have we made globally and regionally to be prepared if the next pandemic were to hit us within the next 18 months? Thank, Thank you, you. Masoud. That will also be discussed in the next session. Monsieur Mariton? Yes, two quick questions. Then, Does the panel draw any lesson from the difference in policies even in Western Europe, for example, the difference between Sweden and France, for example, no lockdown, at least during uh, the first weeks or even month in Sweden. And uh, going beyond Europe, a complete different policy in Australia, for example. So these vast differences in the Western world, what sort of lesson would you draw from that? Second question is on the refusal of vaccination. The refusal of vaccination can be regional problems in uh, uh, Africa, but also problems in some parts of uh, French overseas territories. And now some sort of sequential refusal of vaccination, for example, the low level of vaccination in France presently for the uh, uh, new uh, um, repeats of the vaccination that are required are not actually carried particularly by the elderly. So what's the answer to some sort of fatigue as to vaccination? Thank you. Yes, next to you. Uh, thanks, Christian, for sharing valuable information. My question is uh, uh, how artificial intelligence will help in checking COVID-19 in future? Thank you very much. Thank you. And there are two more questions, and then we'll <coughs> stop it now. M Monsieur Dossou, uh, so three questions. Yeah, Please I'll, be brief. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, while I agree, I mean, we are a think tank that does a lot of work on uh, virus uh, and the growth of it for about 20 years. So the question is more on why we accept this, the, the premise of zoonotic diseases. Uh, I just wanted your insights, especially Christian, on the gain for function where you know these researchers are outsourced to labs outside and the strong belief that we have and that some intelligence and information we have that uh, the Wuhan was not an accident because we had a discussion with the Wuhan medical officer soon after the virus uh, that it may have been uh, an accident that came out of the lab. So how do you at a global level prevent this? Because if you do that, uh, the way to stop it and the cure will be extremely difficult. Thank you. Uh, you know that Israel had been, in a way, a laboratory for developing the Pfizer uh, immunity. As a matter of fact, we became to be like a laboratory for all the world. In Israel, it was not compulsory to take the vaccination. But, of course, it, it, is po it was possible to do it fast because in Israel there is a special uh, construction of the, of the health system. People are belong to one of the, of the branches. We have three or four companies which deal with, say, with uh, health. And every person, every family belongs to one of them. So it was very easy to arrive to all, most of the people. And it works. Now, one of the questions that I have about this, uh, about this immunization and this uh, COVID is there are a lot of people who were spreading up in Israel and all over the world that it is you don't have to be vaccinated, that's wrong, that's have a lot of uh, all kind of 
all kind of, uh, all kind of, in my opinion, rubbish. Um, and it is, it is really a lot of people accept their own opinion and refuse to be vaccinated. The fact is that when we cancel the closure in Israel, so we were in a very uh, bad situation because people who had been vaccinated were okay, but the people who didn't vaccinated would come also to the centers, etc., and make people to be again uh, having the. the, uh, the do you, what do you think about the possibility to make it compulsory? Last question. Second question is: Do you think that then in the future the mRNA vaccinations would work also for other? Uh, other other uh, problems in the world, like cancer, etc. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, futuristic uh, outlook. And, and yes, uh, Israel is a sort of living clinical trial uh, <coughs> cohort on, on COVID-19, and the data from Israel is the most precious at population level. Monsieur Dossou, very briefly, uh, s'il vous plaît, car nous allons être en retard. On va prendre cinq minutes pour les réponses. Merci, M. le Président. C'est presque une consultation personnelle, profitant de la qualité de ce panel. Mais le secret médical... Non, 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 c'est public. Puis c'est une pandémie. Je suis pleinement octogénaire. J'ai déjà pris quatre fois le vaccin et j'étais admissible à la cinquième fois il y a deux mois. Et puis on m'a dit non, ce n'est pas encore sûr, ne prends pas. Donc j'ai hésité. Alors, ma question concrète, puis-je aller directement en partant d'ici au cinquième vaccin euh, Cinquième oui. fois, voilà. Merci. Merci, oui. merci beaucoup. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. And, and merci. I think this is a, um, I'd, I'd like, um, you know, either Antoine or Christian to address this, because that relates to, to your point, uh, Antoine, of either continuing waves or continuing ongoing circulation of what we now call a soup of variants. And as we face that, uh, and as we know that immunity is waning in people aged, let's say, over 70 within four to five months, and that That's was shown in Israel with the last booster, um, what does that imply in terms of uh, continuous boosters? Let's, let's start with this question and I'll then ask, uh, let, let's have Antoine and, and Christian react. Then I'd like to turn to Juliette, uh, Ide and uh, Maha for just the final points. And... Bon, pour uh, la question du vaccin, uh, clairement, on a aujourd'hui un vaccin qui n'est uh, pas dangereux, qui est très bien toléré. Euh, en particulier chez les personnes âgées, il ne fait même pas de réaction réactogénique. Et donc, euh, conseiller un nouveau rappel pour toute personne qui n'a pas eu de rappel dans les six mois qui précèdent me semble être de bonne politique. Euh, il n'y a pas de niveau de preuve majeur aujourd'hui sur le plan scientifique parce que le, les fabricants courent derrière les variants en permanence et n'ont pas le temps de mettre en place des essais cliniques formels aussi puissants que ceux qui avaient été faits au départ. Mais on peut aujourd'hui raisonnablement recommander une dose vaccinale à toute personne éligible au vaccin qui n'a pas eu de dose depuis six mois. Et puis, pardon, vas-y. Non, non, Christian no, just to follow up on this on a more general basis, and this goes with the question in Israel. We have RNA-based vaccines. They, will, they are being adjusted to other viruses, possibly on cancer, but this is another story. The problem of these vaccines is that they do not generate a strong cellular immune response. So this is why there is still very much ongoing research on other vaccines for the future, which would provide a longer uh, lasting memory. But for the time being, we have this. It can be adjusted very rapidly to a new situation, and this is very valuable. But you, you must just take in consideration that there is, at the same time, a huge effort 
of novel vaccines. And I just take this opportunity for the question on artificial intelligence. This is very interesting because artificial intelligence is being tested on the data sharing, for example, long COVID, which is very multifactorial, very much beneficiated of this. But artificial intelligence can only be effective if you nurture it with the good data and with the accurate data. And then it always comes back to local and regional capacities. Otherwise, you are working on nothing. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, is currently being discussed is establishing at regional level yeah. across the world different hubs that would master some of the basic technologies, mRNA, and Juliette, you mentioned the hub in South Africa, but also uh, adenovirus-based uh, vaccines, also whole inactivated vaccines, because let's not remember, within one year, um, 2020, uh, we, we saw the mRNA vaccines from the US uh, and European industry, we saw uh, the Chinese Sinopharm based on inactivated vaccines, we saw the adenoviral vaccines, AstraZeneca and the Sputnik. We saw a Cuban vaccine, we saw an Indian vaccine. So within a year, the world, based on existing technological platforms, could, could innovate and bring uh, effective vaccines. I'm not entering the, the discussion here of the relative efficacy, but thank you, Antoine, for making the point. And I'd like to make this clear because several people ask that question, two doses of Sinopharm plus one dose of Pfizer or three doses of Sinopharm are equivalent to three doses of Pfizer as far as we know at, at population level. Maybe a last turn of hearing the questions, um, maybe uh, Maha, would, would you say something? Um, thank you. C clearly very important questions and I, um, I, again, I, I, I reinforce the need for the strongest surveillance systems in, in every country. Uh, the next, uh, you know, uh, virus that may, pr may be uh, predisposing to a pandemic could be in any country. Uh, and, uh, you know, investment in surveillance systems and looking into the zoonotic side, so very much a One Health uh, um, support. Countries need to invest in developing a strong One Health system. Thank you. Thank you. Ide? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> no, we can't hear you, I'm afraid. Okay, can, can, uh, on peut avoir un micro pour Monsieur Chao? Uh, Juliette. Uh, I want to go back to uh, something Christian said almost in passing about the relationship of humans and wild animals. Uh, not just wild animals, but also the environment and our nutritional changes, the distortion yeah. of our nutritional changes. Increasingly, I do believe that there are huge impacts of focusing on our micro microbiomes through an increase in our plant-based intake within dietary, in our diets, and minimizing, if you will, distortion and destruction of our environments, wherein we then become exposed to wild animals with viruses that have been causing uh, many of the pandemics we have been subject to over the past few decades. And I think that's only going to increase until we recognize that man has to be a little bit more circumspect uh, with his, in his relationship with the environment. Yeah. Thank you. Ide. Yeah. The addressing the question how uh, we should do deal future uh, X disease. Uh, as I said, I want to emphasize the most important thing is awareness of public. Yes, because it's an unknown virus, people don't know the detail, but they should understand, they should know how to deal with these things. Uh, as uh, I wanted to point out, uh, due to the SARS happened uh, in Asia several years ago, that gives some awareness to public in Eastern Asia they know something very serious. Uh, that's the, I guess, the point. Even we don't know the detail in future, but 
public should know how to deal with this unknown virus. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists for the very good session. And see you in the video.